Hello and welcome to a special edition of Banfield. To one side, he is a hero, a champion of law and order, the right to bear arms, the American way. To the other side, he is a poster boy for so much that's wrong with America, guns and hate and white entitlement. For 15 months, Kyle Rittenhouse has been a figment of our own beliefs and biases. His case was our cause, whatever that happened to be. And whichever facts didn't fit were filed away or ignored outright, but not tonight. Tonight for the full hour, Kyle Rittenhouse like you've never seen him before. Unfiltered, unedited, with a stunning ordeal behind him and an uncertain future ahead. Kyle, it's good to see you. Thanks for joining me. Thank you for having me on, Ashley. So, huh, four days. It's probably been a bit of a roller coaster, I can imagine. Definitely, definitely. Uh, can you describe it for me, what you've been through in the last four days? In the last four days, um, just hanging out with family, um, decompressing from the last year and a half that I just went through, um, and just trying to relax. Is that something that you can do, is, is relax, given that the person who now Kyle Rittenhouse is? I try to. Um, I, when I do try to relax, um, I lay down and I just turn off from the outside world and not pay attention to what's going on on the outside. And then there is that outside. Um, and then. <laughs> it'll never go away. Uh, have you processed yet everything that's happened, including the verdict that came down Friday? Um, I'm still processing the verdict, um, still very recent. Um, and with everything else in the past, um, I processed what happened. Um, and dealt with my struggles from what I had to do. So what is it for you to process it? What does that mean? Talking to somebody, talking to my therapist, and just helping me get through it and understand everything. So are you, do you have good days and bad days? I do. And describe the, describe the good days first, and then of course I'm gonna ask you to describe the bad ones. Uh, well, the good days are when I when I'm not thinking about anything and what happened and I'm relaxed and calm and then the bad days are when I'm waking up at night because of nightmares or I'm like staring off into space because I'm thinking about what I had to do. Were you um, prepared for the possibility of, of being locked up for 75 years or so? I, I really wasn't. It wasn't something that I tried to think about. I just tried to focus on the positive, but there was always that possibility that I could spend the rest of my life in prison. So it was something that I thought about, like, this is a real possibility that can happen. And yet, um, I think you told Tucker that you were not surprised by the five verdicts that came down on Friday. Um, I was surprised to hear that because I saw you nearly collapse in court. Um, I wasn't surprised. I was just like a stress relief. Like, I wasn't surprised by the meeting. Like, they came to the correct verdict. Um, I was just broken down with emotion and happiness that the jury got it correct. Before you came into the courtroom to hear the verdicts, um, your lawyer said that it was a really rough few moments. Can you describe those those moments as you were walking back? into the courtroom? Well, um, as I was walking back, as I was actually going through the door to learn my fate, uh, my knees buckled in and I had to like catch myself because I didn't know what to expect. And I was just like pale and lightheaded. And then your lawyer said you threw up. I did. And then came into the courtroom right afterwards? Yes. After the verdict. Did you have any opportunity to have any contact with the jury, even there in the courtroom, eye contact, a handshake, anything at all? I did not. Did you ever look at them? Did they look at you? Uh, yeah, a couple times during the trial, I, I would look at the jury and um, they would look at me, but I didn't see really any reaction out of them. So you never got a feel one way or the other of any particular people or as a body in general where, where their heads were? I did not. And yet you felt confident at verdict time. Yes. You know, uh, when you made the decision 
to take the stand. It is the biggest decision anyone will tell a defendant. Um, ultimately, it was yours. Mm -hmm. Did you ever not want to? No, I always wanted to tell my story and tell the truth of what happened on August 25th. Did your lawyers ever not want you to? No, we always, we always thought it was the best for me to go and testify to tell the truth. And are you aware, either during trial or now, how big this became in America? Your story, your trial, uh, the polarization, were you aware of all of that? Not for the first 87 days I spent in jail, but once I got out, I slowly started to realize that people are using this case as a cause when it should never have been used as a cause for their own political agendas. But did you know how big it got? A little bit, uh, a little bit. I'm, I'm probably not as certain now because I live in it. It's probably not as big as I think it is because I live in it. Is it possible it's bigger than you think it is? I, I don't know. Um, I, I really don't know. Part of the um, you know, trial watching process is to watch the defendant at all times, whether he or she is at the defense table or in your particular case, they take the stand. And the moment where you broke down on the stand became a moment that everyone saw through a different lens. Um, those who support you said this was a, uh, an 18 year old kid who was at the end of his rope, uh, genuinely broken up about all of this. And those who don't support you said it was crocodile tears and it was fake. Tell me what it was from your perspective, from that moment that you were trying to describe what was happening to you and you became seized with a feeling. Walk me through that moment. Well, what happened when I broke down is I have PTSD and I, it doesn't really, I don't really break down, but something in it, like thinking about all the answers and like reimagining in my head, just it made me have a PTSD episode. So your lawyer mentioned it might have been um, a panic attack. Yes, that's, that's what it was. Does this happen often? Uh, sometimes, not as much as it used to, um, but occasionally I will. And what, what triggers it? Uh, if I'm really deep in thought thinking about it and I don't go through the preparation, not the preparations, but I don't calm myself down in time or I forget to breathe. But thinking about the incident itself, is that... Does that bring it on? Sometimes it really depends on the day. So critics will say on the stand, you, you had a, a tough time describing um, the sequence of events that, that happened. But then on Tucker Carlson, it was as though it was a normal conversation. How would you answer to that? Um, well, I wasn't being, I wasn't fighting for my life when I was on the stand. I was fighting for my life on the stand. I wasn't fighting for my life when I was on Tucker Carlson's show. And Does it feel weird to you to be scrutinized every moment, um, every wink, every nod, every look, uh, everything you say, every word you use? Are you used to this? Does it, has it sunk in that everyone's watching you? Well, I know everybody's watching me and I, I don't really pay attention to any anything people say. Um, it just I don't let it affect me or get to me. Tell me about um, your your movements. I mean, I can walk out this door and no one will bat an eye. Um, you don't quite have that same freedom right now. Talk to me a little bit about your your situation, your security. Well, um, LT is, um, he's not my, he, he helps with security, but he's way more than that. He's like a mentor, he gives advice, he helps protect me, make sure I'm, he makes sure that I'm safe. Um, so we like go through back ways and I try not to get recognized at all. So this is a, a grave concern? Yes, I don't like really um, like when like fans recognize me or anti-fans recognize me. I just like to try to be normal as possible. So, so talk life. to me about that. What happens when, as you say, fans recognize you? What happens when people who aren't quite fans recognize you? Well, that hasn't happened yet. Um, but when fans recognize me, they want to take a picture with me. And I just, I just don't want to be taking pictures with people I don't know. But have you run into some tight spots with people who, um, who aren't supportive? I haven't yet. 
There have obviously been death threats. Um, your attorney said that even he had received numerous death threats, uh, I think by Friday night, by the night of the verdict. And, and have you also received those? Um, I haven't received them directly, but they've been directed towards me. I just try my best to ignore them. How do they come in? Um, I believe they're just posted on social media or sent to my attorney saying, hey, we're going to kill you or something like that. Have, have you been apprised of the details? Like, can you be specific about what some people have said? Because usually it's a lot more than, hey, I'm going to kill you. Usually there's a lot more to it. Um, I, I can't really, like, I don't really know much. I don't read them. I don't find it necessary to read them, so I couldn't tell you exactly what they're saying. I just know they'll, they're threatening my life. And is your mother aware of what's come in? Um, I believe so. So it, it sounds to me almost like you've got, uh, you've got people kind of shielding you from the worst of it, from the, the details of what people are saying and doing. Yes. And what about um, the, the police? I think you mentioned um, on, on Tucker that the FBI is aware of the threats that have come in. But then you had an interesting reaction um, about the FBI, and to some it sounded political, like you don't agree with the FBI. No, no, no. Um, what I said is, um, Tucker asked me, do you think the government is going to help protect you? And I said, I hope so. Um, but we all know how the FBI works, and I was referring to the FBI drone they were flying surveilling on U.S. citizens. But you don't have a lot of confidence in the FBI um, looking after your well-being? I, I couldn't tell you. Um, like I said on Tucker, I hope so, but I don't know. Do you have a political feel? I mean, listen, the FBI has become a political football like so many things in our society right now. Uh, lots of people during the Trump era were very anti-FBI, others very pro. Uh, did, did some of that seep into your feeling at all, the pro and anti-FBI feelings? No. Um, like, I was 17, I couldn't even vote, so I didn't really pay much attention to those type of politics. Uh, do you have any concern about where you're going to live? Have you chosen a place to live? Do you, do you, have you thought that far ahead yet? I have, but I don't want to say on air where I plan to live just to be free of any harassment. Even a state or even a part of the country, north, south, east, west? Uh, America. But you want to stay? Yes. Yeah. Is security the reason? Yes. 100%? Yes. But Wisconsin, Illinois aren't in the picture? They are not. Because of? The death threats I've been receiving and mainly because of the cold weather. So how are you planning to go about being Kyle Rittenhouse? With a name like Rittenhouse, it's not Smith. Are you thinking of changing your name? I, I am considering changing my name um, and growing a beard maybe, uh, losing some weight. I, I gained it all back during this uh, stressful time um, and just changing my appearance do you think that's going to help? I hope so, but never know. But in, in terms of like the future and, and security, um, that's expensive. If you have to have LT and, and someone helping you um, just to be able to get around, are you going to be able to manage that? Can you, can you afford to keep a, a security detail for months or years to come? Um, I hope so. A lot of people, generous supporters, have been donating at freekyleusa.org, which is helping pay for my... Um, the people that are helping me currently. And I think you had mentioned that you were um, uh, currently enrolled at the University of Arizona. And yes, at Arizona State University. Oh, Arizona State, and you had to defer. Um, I took a compassionate withdrawal from two of my classes because I got overwhelmed with trial coming on. So you're going to go back? I am. When is that? Uh, Next semester that opens up, I'm going to re-enroll in those classes just so I can finish them up and, and this is, pursue this my is career in nursing. online right now? Yes. But you have hopes to be on campus as any other student would be? Yes. And do you think that's going to be doable? I hope so because I just want to be a normal 18-year-old college student trying to uh, better my future and get into a career in nursing. And, and what about law? I think I heard you mention that's also in the That is cards. something I am considering. I'm, I'm big on nursing right now. Um, I, I do want to like, look into law and see if it is right for me. And if I decided to, it would definitely be criminal defense work. Okay, hold that thought. Uh, when we come back after the break, um, 
There are a number of job offers that have already come in for Kyle Rittenhouse. Three Republican congressmen have used Twitter to suggest that Kyle should be their intern, one of them even joking about it. When we come back, I'm going to ask Kyle about that and what it might actually mean as well. We're back with Kyle Rittenhouse after the break. We are back with Kyle Rittenhouse. And Kyle, we've had people from uh, social media world who we've invited to ask you questions. So if it's all right, I'm going to ask one question for a viewer named um, Jen. Uh, Jen says, you've been offered congressional internships from Matt Gates and Madison Cawthorn, among others. And I believe uh, Paul Gosar was one of them. Do you plan on accepting these internships or getting back to private life and staying out of politics? I do not plan on accepting any internships. Um, I don't want to get involved in politics at all. I don't know. I know nothing about it. And um, thank everybody for their support. But I'm good. Thank you. So no interest in carrying the banner for anyone uh, in this highly polarized situation you found yourself in. No, I I don't have any interest in that because. To me, this case is about the right to self-defense, not what, not where you fall left or right. But you know that loads of people have um, sort of put you up there as a reason for or against their cause. I, yeah, which I don't agree with because I didn't want to be. I, I'm not a cause person. Um, I'm just a person who has attacked and defended myself. Have you become a pawn, though? Do you think? Um, I believe Lynn Wood and John Pierce used me for their own um, pawn. That's part of the reason why I fired them. Um, to be clear, Lynn Wood and John Pierce were your first attorneys correct. in your case. So walk me through a little bit. I think people hear the name and then they hear the controversy, but they don't know the whole story. So what, in a nutshell, is the whole story with those first two attorneys? Uh, all right. So Lynn Wood and John Pierce. Um, on September, uh, August 27th, became counsel, and um, they started raising money, and they raised over two million dollars before September 5th of 2020, and they wanted to fight extradition with a militia argument, which is not, which I didn't even know what a militia was until November 20th when I got bailed out, but they wanted, they went on to say that I was in an unorganized militia, which is just not true and they didn't respect my wishes, and they kept me away from my family for 87 days. And I think I thanked them for raising the money, um, but I could have been bailed out a lot sooner in, in September if they, hadn't, if they hadn't kept me in jail. When and how did you find out that they had raised enough money for your bail and still weren't posting it? Uh, shortly before I fired uh, Lynn, uh, before my mom fired Lynn Wood, and uh, I want to say December. But why would she fire him? Did she fire him because she found out that the money was in the pot but wasn't being put towards bail? Um, we fired him because he was like going on with all this QAnon and election fraud stuff and just stuff we don't agree with. And so it was his political views that led to you firing Lynn Wood? A mixture of a little bit of that. And what else was in the mix? Just how he is as a person. And what does that mean? Uh, he's insane. What made you think he was insane? Just how he, like, how he thinks he's God and he just does, like, says all these weird things like, like, we're going to keep that boy in jail because there's not going to be any, um, there's not going to be any civil or criminal cases come no, come the election, which is just complete insanity. So you fired him and got a hold of the, the money that was raised and bailed out. And now I think it's around $2 million. Am I Correct. mistaken? $2 million. Okay. What happens to that money now, and what do you know about it? On the day that I was acquitted, Lynn Wood and his attorneys filed a motion with the Kenosha County Court saying, hey, we want that $2 million back that we raised for Kyle, which is supposed to go towards paying my legal bills that I still have going. And he filed that motion as the verdict was being read, as I was walking into court to learn my fate. And he, he just was trying to grift that money back when he said he raised it for, for me so I can be able to pay my legal bills. And so you're in a legal fight for that money? Uh, we're, 
We're, um, yes. And you've hired civil attorneys? Correct. And uh, how much money do you have left in legal bills to pay? Um, I couldn't give you a number on the top of my head. I looked a couple days ago, but I wouldn't be able to tell you exactly right now. I've been very busy over the past couple days. I, that sounds right about right, I would think. Um, do you, the, the people who put forth that money, uh, could they come from all over the country, I'm assuming? Yes. And they have, a, many of them, a political cause as well, because if it was raised under the political banner and, and your former attorneys were using that politically to raise money, they, with, they might feel a certain way. With all of our donors, I don't believe my donors are political. I believe my donors are the ones that believe in the right to self-defense. We have donors on the left and we have donors on the right. We just... So do you feel you owe anybody uh, who helped raise money, or do you feel you owe anyone who sent money um, in any respect, whether you owe them uh, a political stance or whether you owe them um, certain kinds of interviews. People criticize that you did the Tucker Carlson interview because it was all part and parcel of the money raising. Um, well, actually with Tucker, they reached out to us and they wanted to film a documentary. There was no money exchange and there, it, we never even talked about money. It never even and it never was brought out. It was about memorial, memorializing my story. And um, with the donors who donated, I don't believe I owe them a political stance, but I do owe them a huge thank you, and thank you for all the support. So you don't feel that you owe anybody um, you know, a backing to their cause because they, they backed you? Look, I don't think politics have anything to do with this, so I don't think I owe anybody a political stance, but I do owe them a huge thank you for all the support and donations. So I have another question. I mean, you know, a lot of this has become political, and, and many people have felt that it was also um, a question that involved racism as well, and I know you have a lot of views on that. So this question comes from Brian uh, in Hampton, Virginia, and Brian says, Mr. Rittenhouse, you have stated that you are not a racist, but yet there's video footage of you using hand signs that are used by groups that are considered by many to be white supremacists. Why have you associated with members of groups like the Proud Boys? Why have you used hand signs that are commonly associated with white supremacy? That's a good question. I didn't know that the OK hand sign was a symbol for white supremacy, just as I didn't know that those people in the bar were Proud Boys. They were set up by my former attorney who was fired because of that, for putting me in situations like that with people I don't agree with, by having them set up for security without telling us their background. And if I would have known they were Proud Boys, I would have said absolutely not. So to be clear, which attorney uh, put you in that bar? John Pierce. He took you to that bar? He arranged it. He wasn't there, but he set it up and arranged it. Your attorney arranged for a then 17-year-old to go to a bar to meet those people? To, for them to do security. And then they asked to buy me a drink, and I said, sure. And they knew that you were 17? In Wisconsin, it's legal. To drink at 17 in a bar? Yeah, it's, it's weird how it works down there. I'm going to have to check on that. I would think you'd have to be with your guardian or you your have parent. Yeah, with your uh, parent or was guardian. Was your mom with you? Yes. Okay, well, that makes a little bit uh, more sense. But so uh, if you have, um, you know, some second thoughts about some of the things that happened in the last year, would that be among the second thoughts? I definitely um, don't think it looked good to hang out with people who are now known to be proud boys. I definitely wouldn't do that again. Did they identify themselves to you while you were there? Was it a complete mystery until the headlines popped up later? I found out they were Proud Boys when I saw the headlines. I thought they were just a bunch of like construction dudes based on how they looked. And that was a meeting ostensibly to set up security for you going forward? Uh, it was for that, for that hearing for them to watch over my attorney's office. For a, for a hearing? Yes. I just want to be very clear. This was supposed to be those men who you met with were going to help you in a security situation? Yes. And you never hired them? No. Why not? Uh, I don't. I don't associate with the Proud Boys. I have. You found out that they were, yeah. and you decided against. Yeah, I, I don't want anything to do with them. Okay, so many more questions. Um, if you can hold one second, I'm just going to uh, go to a quick break. Um, when we come back, there are a number of other 
people on social media who have asked questions of Kyle Rittenhouse. So I'm going to fit a couple more in there. If I had enough time, I'd fit them all in. But one person is asking for a certain kind of advice. And when we come back after the break, you'll hear that question and a lot more from Kyle Rittenhouse. We're back after this. With Kyle Rittenhouse. And Kyle, so many people have had so many questions about the AR-15 and about taking a, an AR-15 into a crowd and a volatile situation. Looking back on that, do you think that was a good idea? If I would have known that I would have, would I if I would have known that I had to take two lives that night, I don't think I would have gone there, but we can't change that. Generally speaking, it's, you know, there are going to be a lot of protests in the future. That's going to continue. Would you advise anyone else to take an AR-15 assault style weapon or high powered rifle into a volatile situation? Um, after what I gone through, um, I don't think it's worth having to Fight for your life if you are ever attacked. Um, of course, protect your house if you're at your house, but I don't think anybody should be in that situation. Um, and they may be forced to defend themselves, and they may end up being prosecuted just for simply having to, to defend their life. But looking back on it, you regret being there that night? I wouldn't say I regret. I definitely... I regret going there. I don't regret defending myself. I regret making the decision to go there. But what I'm trying to say is, I, if I could go back, I would not have gone there. I would have stayed home, but we can't change that. I went there to protect property, but I was attacked by violent people, which, which forced me to defend myself. How do you um, process the it was quite a quite an incident that you were in you know involved in it the images of what you saw when you fired your weapon did you know that the gun was that powerful had you fired a weapon before and and seen anything like this before were you fluid and comfortable with a weapon like that that rifle was the only weapon i was legally allowed to have um i've shot it before and it's a gun is a gun it's so got to do the same thing, it fires a bullet. Some don't, uh, some do. I mean, high powered weapons can do a lot more damage than, than say a pistol, but are you affected at all by the incident itself, the, the pulling the trigger and seeing the result of pulling the trigger and one man dying, another man dying, and, a, and another man being severely injured? You had to have seen what happened. Look, I have nightmares from being attacked. Um, I remember having to defend myself, and it's something that keeps me up at night. Tell me a little more about that. Um, like I said earlier, it's something that I live with of having to take somebody's life and defend myself. So when you have those nightmares, um, what do they look like? What do they sound like? What, what's happening in, in, your, in your nightmares? It's just reliving the events of what happened. But be more specific. Um, I'll wake up in like a cold sweat, um, reliving being attacked and chased and that night of what happened to me. And, and do you ever uh, have the same kinds of nightmares about the deaths of those men and the injury to the third man? I have not really, but I have nightmares of them killing me if I didn't defend myself. What do you think of when you when you think of it's a lot for a, for a 17, now 18-year-old um, man to, to process, uh, taking the lives of people, humans, real, real men with real families. Um, do you think much about it? Do you stop down and ponder the lives lost, the families left behind, or are you not there yet? I was forced to defend myself, and I think about that every day if they never attacked me. But it doesn't eat away at you. It does bother me. Nobody ever wants to have to kill somebody, but I was forced to defend myself. If you had a message for, um, for the families of those men, what would it be? I'm not sure. I, I don't know how I can answer that right now. Because there's pending civil lawsuits that I believe are going to be filed. So 
So would you, you would be able to answer, do you have a feeling one way or the other, but you're, you can't answer because of civil litigation? I'm not going to answer that question right now. Okay, understand. Um, what is your feeling now uh, about the, the weapon that you, uh, that you used? Do, do you feel the same about the weapon today that you did the day before you were in the circumstance? Has anything changed about you and the use of a weapon and, and carrying a weapon? It was the only weapon that night that I was legally allowed to have. If I could have any other weapon that night, I would have carried a pistol. And what about going forward? Will you ever, will you ever brandish an AR-15 assault style weapon again? Are you worried about it? Do you fear it? Do you have a, a, a visceral reaction to it? I just want to kind of get in your head about how you're affected by all of this. I don't know how to answer that. Um, I, I can't read the future on that one. How do you feel about about AR-15s now? I believe everybody has the right to own firearms, but I don't know. Without question, they have the right. Um, but the feelings, like, do you, do you, some people might say, I, I never want to touch the gun again. Some people will say, I absolutely um, will touch that gun again. It, it hasn't affected me in that way. Like I said, it's people's rights to own firearms if they want to. Right. Under Wisconsin law, um, you were within your right? Yes. The jury decided it's clear cut. Under other states, it may not have gone like that because the law is different. There's a duty to retreat. Other elements of the law may not have been met. I did retreat in Wisconsin, um, and I don't know the other laws for other states. I just know I was charged in Wisconsin, and I defended myself. And the certain Wisconsin. laws, yeah, and the certain laws in Wisconsin certainly were, were in your favor in this particular case, and that may be very well why the, the jury um, voted the way they did. In other states, that might not have happened. Are those other states wrong? I don't know the states for the other law, but I, it was self-defense around the board. It was me being chased and somebody trying to steal my gun and attack me and pointing a gun at my head and hitting me with a skateboard. When we come back after the break, other questions uh, from our social media users, including the racial component of this, even though the three people who were uh, killed or injured in this case were white, Kyle is white, it is still, without question, still a racial story. When we come back, we'll dig back into that. More with Kyle Rittenhouse right after this. Uh, with Kyle Rittenhouse. Kyle, you know that so many people have made this story about race. It was a protest you know, with Black Lives Matter, because of the uh, shooting of Jacob Blake, the incident itself that involved you included all white people, and yet it is still hanging over this case, the, the, the racial component of it. With that in mind, I have a question for you from one of our viewers. His name is James, and James asks this. Do you think that a black man would have been acquitted of the same charges? I believe so, because this case had nothing to do with race. It just had to do with the right to self-defense. If he had the same resources and everything, which I believe he would have, it, it's about the right to self-defense, and the jury would have got it right. Some people would say, pipe dream. Definitely not in the American justice system that you may have been given the presumption of innocence, but a black person wouldn't have enjoyed that same presumption of innocence, and it would have been a bigger uphill climb. Do you have any thoughts one way or on the uh, other on that? I, I do believe there's a lot of prosecutorial misconduct where prosecutors paint all people as guilty before innocence, which I don't agree with. And I'll, I'll do one more on, on James's question and take you back before uh, getting to trial. Many people have said publicly that they don't think a black person would have made it off the street that night, that they would have been shot by protesters, by police, by, by anybody, but they wouldn't have even have been afforded the luxury of a trial. Do you have any thoughts on that? I don't. Um, I don't know, because what happened, I believe it could have been the same set. Anything could, could have changed. It could have been different either way for me or anybody else. Can you have any empathy towards those who are so frustrated with the justice system? Um, Black Lives Matter is marching in the streets because they feel they don't get a fair shake in the American justice system. Can you empathize? Do you have a feeling as to why they would feel that way? Absolutely. Every it's one of our American fundamental rights to peacefully protest and voice our opin opin opinion and assemble to make change.
Yeah, but then the justice issue, whereas, you know, um, perhaps a white defendant would have an easier go than a black defendant would, if they even, again, make it to defendant status. Do you feel one way or the other about why people feel that way? Why a lot of black Americans or people of color feel they wouldn't get the same treatment that you did? Um, I can understand how some people may feel that way. Um, I believe everybody has the right to a fair trial and be presumed innocent before being proven guilty or innocent before being proven guilty. Do you think it really happens, though? I don't know. Um, I know in my case, I feel like I had to prove my innocence because a prosecutor has so much prosecutorial misconduct, which I believe he does with every case, just my opinion. You mentioned to Tucker Carlson that you support the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, I think a lot of people might have been surprised by that. If they'd made up their minds about you, um, they were very surprised by that. What do you want for the Black Lives Matter movement? I support everybody's right to peacefully protest and demonstrate. And like I said, I support the right to protest and not burn down American cities. But what would you want for the movement? Again, this is a movement that is looking for racial justice, um, police uh, brutality to be uh, mitigated. They're looking for further rights for people of color uh, in, in this country. So you support the Black Lives Matter movement. What would you like to see for that movement as they progress you know, in society? Um, I'm, I, like I said, I support the right to protest and assemble and I believe everybody has a right to protest for change, no matter what their change wants to be. Everybody has that right to protest. Uh, let me ask you this. Uh, I'm not sure, you know, what your friends and family um, have said and done throughout this whole process. Uh, with Facebook, we have a broader group of friends now. Um, have you had? Have you suffered any losses? Have you lost friends or, or family members, or has has anything become difficult for you? Uh, in your inner circle because of what you've been through? Um, I haven't really lost any friends or family members. My aunt um, isn't really on my side until after the acquittal. She was like, no, she now wants to be my friend, apparently. But this caused family strife? Um, only with my aunt. And your aunt is now reconsidering how she felt before the trial just because of the verdict? I, I think so. I don't really know what her motivations are. What did she say to you before the trial? She just said I didn't, I don't like what he, he did, even though I just simply defended myself. So it's, it's been a bit of a rift in the family then. Is that your mom's sister or your dad's sister? My dad's sister. And how, you know, how has the family been all through this, just in terms of you being a 17-year-old, now 18, um, living through something like this, it's big for anybody. It's big for anyone, let alone someone you know your age. How has the family been? It's been hard, but we've been staying strong and staying positive. How, how does that happen? I mean, that's a, it sounds like a good line, but it's, it takes a lot to do that. What kind of support do you feel you've been given, and who do you feel like has been the rock star in your life to, to give you, to make, you know, help you get through this? Uh, definitely my mom and sisters being by my side throughout the entire trial. Um, Joan sat with them and during the trial, and Joan was much more than a jury consultant for them during trial, helping them stay strong and then them staying strong for me. And that's Joel and Demetrius, your jury consultant. Very, very successful uh, yes. jury consultant, right through from OJ, through Kobe, through really big famous mm -hmm. cases. Um, when we come back after the break, I want to ask you about what's next in terms of civil action, because I know this isn't over for you and there's some. There's a landscape. I know you don't want to go into detail, and I understand there's certain, certain things you can't say, but, um, but well, I'll, I'll, I'll ask you what you can, and, and we'll see what we can do. How does that sound? We're back right after this with Kyle Rittenhouse. Back now with Kyle Rittenhouse. Kyle, there's been no secret that you're none too pleased with um, what the president said about you, flashing your picture in a campaign ad before he was president, um, saying the words white supremacy. Um, many have said that you might prevail in a defamation case. Some have said you won't. Do you plan it? Um, I'm not going to comment on that. I will say, though, I have really good civil attorneys that are handling all these issues. And they're in place now. You've hired them. They've been retained. 
So that's a, a big question, not just uh, the president, but I know Nick Sandman uh, reached out to you to say, I'm, I'm here for advice if you need it. Um, and he had many defamation cases against media outlets, and you know he was able to settle with many of them. Is that your same course of action? You want to hold the media accountable for things that people have said, possibly the president and vice president? Um, I, like I said, I have really good civil attorneys who are going to be working on that on my behalf. But it's something that's a possibility? Potentially. Potentially. Are you serious about it? Uh, like I said, my civil attorneys are handling that. The, and the reason I ask you is because you used the words, um, that's actual malice defaming my character when Tucker brought up the president last night. It is. Those are the key words, which I assumed you must be preparing for something against the president. Like I said, my civil attorneys are handling that. <laughs> You've perfected the art of skirting that question. Okay, I'm going to ask you uh, a question from... James, it's a good one, uh, as a person receiving so much polarizing mixed reactions from the general public, ranging from praise to scrutinization of your character and your actions, what is the best piece of advice that you've received during or following the trial? The best piece of advice is to stay calm and know what I stand for and know that I did. I, what I did was right. That, that's advice my therapist said. Like, I know me. I know that I defended myself. What have you learned about yourself? That I'm a lot stronger than I think, um, emotionally and mentally. And what do you want people to know about you? That I'm just a normal 18-year-old kid trying to move on with my life and just want to live in peace and attend college and study. Well, I appreciate you taking the time. I know this isn't easy, especially uh, since it's only been four days, since you found out you're not going to go to prison for life. That's a lot to process. But thank you. I appreciate the time to um, ask you these probing questions and get a fair answer. But you're going to have to answer me those civil questions the next time we talk, okay? Thank you, Ashley. Thanks, Kyle. And thank you all for joining us. I wish we had more time, but we'll see you again tomorrow night on Banfield. Thank you for watching. Click the red subscribe button below so you can get more of News Nation's fact-driven, unbiased coverage.